Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction Book Review Podcast. My name is Luke Burridge and this is the show where I review every single science fiction book that I read as I read it. Joining me today is Juliana. Say hello. Hello everyone. And we are not recording in person today. I am in Lima in Peru and uh, Juliana is in Berlin in Germany. So we are recording this via Skype. So sorry about any reduction in audio quality. Um, yeah. And we also can't see each other. So uh, we can't just like prod each other if we want to talk so uh, hopefully uh, we both get our say anyway today's book do you want to talk about this why are we reading this one um well certainly because um it's a book that you, we both read before but you haven't done a review on the podcast yet have you no i, I i've not reviewed this it's isaac asimov's caves of steel and i've I think I've reviewed a few other books by Isaac Asimov, but uh, not this one. And it is one of my favorite Isaac Asimov books, I think. Exactly. And so um, why not uh, give it a, a little review on the podcast? Yeah. So uh, we read this one just as an ebook, And uh, again, this time I was like, OK, you finish reading it and then tell me and then I'll finish reading it and we'll do the review. Because otherwise I often finish reading things um, a lot quicker just because I have more time or I listen to an audiobook version. But um, in this case, yeah, you did finish it, and I finished this up last night, so it's pretty pretty clear in my head. Um, so, yeah, Caves of Steel is a novel by the American writer Isaac Asimov. It is essentially a detective story and illustrates an, as, uh, an idea Asimov advocated, that science fiction can be applied to any literary genre rather than just a limited genre, which is a, uh, uh, the first line on Wikipedia. That's cool. Yeah. And this is this is certainly adds to why I enjoyed this book so much. Yeah. Because it does combine two of my favorite uh book topics. <laughs> yeah, I think the reason why I recommended this to you when we I think it must have been when we first started dating and you were like, "Oh, what, you know, what science fiction yeah. books would you totally. recommend?" and you had read a few um in the past, but and I was like, "Ah, okay." Let's try Caves of Steel and these uh, and others in the series because you were more into writing, reading this crime fiction and detective fiction. Um, yes, so. so that was actually um, I got this um, originally when we got together as a, a paper book, and it had three of those robot stories um, within one book. It was like a, a compilation, and I read it in German first. So, yeah. uh, and this time I read it in English. In the original in the English. English, yes. Yes. Uh, Which was fun. Yeah. So this is part of his robot series. It is a publication date, June 1954. Um, and uh, the thing that I like about the robot series, I can't remember which podcast I heard this on, or was it a lecture or something, and it's the idea being that um, lots of stories will have a, like, they are kind of uh, got a modern setup. They have their own internal rules that they follow and things. And um, there's a very easy shortcut to get into those rules or what kind of story that you have. So if a story starts once upon a time, um, you'll straight away know that it is a, uh, you know, like a fairy, fairy tale. tale. And yeah. all of the rules that come along with that, it just starts up, you know. Um, yeah. Also, and, you, I think you accept other rules easier. Yes, if of you course. already know. But, yeah. But then there's also like, you know, histories and stuff sort of like in the time of this, you know, and you go, right, OK, so now we're going to get some epic story, you know, in the age. <laughs> yeah. of, and also with Star Wars, you know, like a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You, you just hear that and you're like, oh, right. I know what I know what we're into here. I know yeah. what, I know what rule set we have in Star it's Trek. <laughs> in Star Trek, it is sort of like, you know, um, uh, going where no one a man has gone before. No, no, it's it. these are the these are the. Uh, this is the log the of the... Is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, also, you know that you're on a science expedition ship. This is generally yes, how it, it is. So, it you always, know people yeah. who want to find new places, new yeah. people. But it, always, but it just always starts off like captain's log, whatever. And you just hear that and you're like, oh, right, okay, I know what rule set now. Um, I think I heard that in, in relation to, I think, the Isaac Asimov... Uh, robot stories in where it st always starts off by saying you know like these are the three laws of robotics and as soon as you read those at the start of a of a story or see them in the you know at the start of a story you're like okay i know kind of what story what kind of story that i'm getting into here um, yeah and that's it, it, so the case is this. I'm not sure. I can't remember if it actually starts off like listing those three laws of robotics, but a lot of the short stories do um, about the uh, you know about these robot stories. Um, yeah. Do you, I think you, this one doesn't doesn't um, have them, but it 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 
it mentions them earlier. Yes, it on. mentions them. But I'm just saying, as soon as you know that this is a story of robots with positronic brains and that obey the three laws of robotics, you know what kind of story it's going to be. And pretty much every single one of these stories, these robot stories, or at least the early ones, is like Isaac Asimov putting down, like, what would it take for there to be a... Uh, uh, a society with robots living alongside men and what would we need to do to have people ha- be happy about that and that is of course he's like okay let's bring in these three laws of robotics which he developed over a, a, a time with some you know over uh, some short stories writing um yeah but of course every single one of these uh, uh readings every one of these ideas is okay it doesn't matter if we put these in place uh humans are still not going to be comfortable around robots because you know, they'll play out in this way, or it'll play that way, or play yeah. out in this way. And this book really kind of wraps up um, so many of those ideas of like, okay, it doesn't matter how good the robots are or um, how safe they are. Here's a reason why in the future people will not want to be uh, around, them, yeah, around like, robots yes. or whatever. So, uh, um, so um, because you mentioned the, the laws of robotics, I, I marked the, the first time it was actually mentioned in the book. Okay. Because I, for me, it starts off way more like a, a detective story at the beginning, which oh, is yes. together with a police yeah. guy. Yeah. And on page, on, from, on my pages here, on, on the ebook, it was yeah. on page 171 that it was first mentioned. Of like how many in, pages, though? Like what percentage of that through the of, book? Uh, oh, uh, wait a second. Um, this book has 271 uh, okay no, 269 pages for me yeah so it's a big chunk of the way into the book where um yeah it's there but you know of course people going into this know it's a robot you know it's like an i robot kind of story i guess of course um, yeah because as soon as you're introduced to ah uh, daniel olivor um yeah, yeah. People, the, the readers would know that if anyone had read any of these other stories robot stories they'd have uh, got that um, but there's the um, there's the other robot that you get introduced in with first, What's which that? is quite nice. Ah, uh, well, Sammy. Sammy. And this is kind of like the first real encounter with a robot working for humans, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, in this book. But the whole point is that there are no, there are only two robots in the whole story, unlike yeah. some other as of off books. So the setup is, um, well, put it this way: when I was reading this book, I've read this book twice before three times before so none of this story was any surprise to me and I knew what happened and so I was kind of like coming at it from it from a different direction in this reading because uh uh you know because I like I say I already know what's happening so I can kind of see the story like developments as they come along and it's quite fun to read a, a detective novel when you know who done it you know just to, and then you can kind of see more of the craft of the writing you know because it's not playing tricks on you it's all just laid bare sure. um, yeah but one thing I noticed a lot more about reading it this time is that it's very much a dystopian novel. Uh, it's very much like t- taking the ideas from 1984, like with, you know, the different levels of society, even to the point where, yeah, in your room is a television, which is, you know, you can't watch it all the time, but it's it's going to be on on these times or you can watch it yeah. these times. In fact, you don't have a choice to watch it or not at these times, you are going to watch the TV at this time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, like lots you're, of... classified, you're classified in these different caste system yes. things, you know, the C categories and stuff. Yeah. So it depends very much on how your standard in society is. Yeah. Uh, much and benefit of anything you get. Yeah. And if you get declassified, that's really bad because then you're not like any, you don't have any human rights anymore. Yeah. And uh, as you work your way to the levels, you can, you can eat food in private or you can take a shower or you have running water in your room, you know. And uh, I'd forgotten, I mean, that was the thing that really stood out to me that I'd forgotten how much this book is like, ah, we are in it. Um, a world with was it eight billion people or something like that? As though that is yeah. a as though that is a high number of people. We're like, are we to like seven billion or something? Six, yeah. six, seven billion at the moment. Um, but I guess in, in 1954, that was an unbelievable high number of people. Yeah, of course, there was probably only about two billion people or th- whatever at that time. Yeah, um, actually, maybe it even has it in, in, in steel case, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, and everyone lives in these underground. Uh, what, what does it say here? I'm sure there's. I'm sure it must say. Isn't it like the domes? Well, yeah, everyone lives under domes, and this is one of those things that uh, I always find weird in these science fiction novels, where there's a 
the, the story relies on a social um what would you want to call it like in this case in this case it's like nobody's allowed to go outside uh, and in other books it's sort of like everyone wears gloves all the time and it's like oh no you would never yeah. have anyone without gloves and yeah. i i always find that funny that there's these rules and it, the rules are held up as something that oh no earthman would ever walk outside everyone you'd get claustrophobic yeah. they stay under the domes um and it's fun it's yeah, fun it, that it, that's what the story relies on um, yeah, it's also interesting to see how easy societies can accept rules as just normal behavior because they yeah. literally say in this book there is no literal law to leave the dome or yeah. like um, you can physically just do it. There is no, yeah. there are no, no gates or anything. You can just leave it. But humans just accept a certain behavior as a rule that nobody would ever even think of breaking. Yeah. And that is interesting because I often challenge myself in questioning normal social behavior and asking yeah. me, why am I doing this? Yeah. Which is what rules am I following now that I don't know that I'm following that I exactly. don't even realize. Will. However, I do think it is, like I say, it's fun to read that kind of stuff, but I always find it is a, a bit of a failing when it's just accepted that literally no Earthman would ever do that. And at the end of the book, no yeah. Earthman has done it, has has gone outside. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I, I think... It's quite that, convenient. Yeah, it's very convenient. And that's always that thing, like, you know, in these, what were the books we're reading where, like, oh, everyone has to have gloves on? Um, I can't remember what the books were, but we were talking, I was thinking about that recent book. Is um, it Han, Han, Han Yuli? No, Han Yuli, Yu, Yu, Yu Han Lee. Yeah, but there's, you know, there's all this kind of stuff and it's sort of like, oh, you're not allowed to use your left hand or you always have to have a glove on your left hand or you're not allowed to do this and nobody yeah. would ever think about oh, this. Yeah. It, certainly in the Anne Leckie books. Yes, that's it. Yeah, some Anne Leckie books. It's like, oh, no, nobody would ever do this, you know, or no, yeah. human, oh, but these aliens would, oh, whatever. Um, yeah. And I always find it a bit weird because... In every, every rule like that, I think it just sets up a, a taboo and there would be like a whole like cult of people or maybe not a cult, but a whole like per, like type of personality, which would get a thrill out of that. It's sort of like, yeah, of course we're not allowed outside, but of course people go outside like because yes. 2% of the population goes outside because they're the weird ones who get a thrill out of doing <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah. that, and it's and it's weird that these books never really think about yeah that's like going against those unspoken rules is a kink. And everyone follows those rules. Yeah, yeah. If every if there is a rule that everybody follows, one percent of the population will find it stimulating to do the opposite. Exactly. Um, so, just, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, so everyone lives in these, you know, the caves of steel are these domes, all these cities have got domes over them, but they're not just cities with domes. It's sort of like it's just completely built up. There is no outside. There isn't even. It, I mean, it's difficult. I, I find it difficult to picture how many levels there are to this this uh, New York. Um, but, yeah, uh, it feels like very much like a, a city that we know. Yeah. And just, I don't know. I, I also don't really understand. I, w I have some problems understanding what the space town thing is. Yeah, like, how, what, yeah, why is it different? Where like, is it? And, yeah. Like, is it up in the air or is it on the ground? No, or no, it's like, like over to one side, but like it seems like uh, what, what is the boundary between them? It's like, oh, yeah, they meet up here. And I'm like, well, if Space Town is, if, if, if the city has got, you know, um, what is it, 20, bil 20 million people in the city, or however much they say, yeah. if, if the city has 20 million people in it, like a spaceport on the edge, like how big is that? And it always seems like it's a very small place. You know, you can just go over there and there's like a few courtyards yeah, or whatever. Um, and they do live in the open air, yeah. Yeah, so, apparently, but you go there's, but also the buildings are connected, but they can see outside. Yeah, yeah it's it's not entirely clear. Like the the yeah. vibe is clear. Like the the, yeah. the idea is clear, but a bit of the geography is a bit weird. It's a little bit vague. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, even when a, even when a crowd was rioting and wanting to get into the spaceport, there was actually they could have just gone out of a gate. Like the humans could have just gone out of a gate of the city, gone across land. And then gone in through a gate, like an unguarded gate of the spaceport, just because they could. And yeah. I'm like, have they? Has nobody ever heard of fences? It's, like, is yeah. a fence uh, just a fence? Like, sure, people, humans don't want to go outside, but a fence would be handy. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a weird one. It's a little bit, and uh, especially if there are riots, 
Uh, yeah. If people really want to write, they yeah. will just go outside, right? Yeah, and that's what this book is about. It's like, oh no, people don't just break down shops and loot and riot and and kill people and you know and smash robots or something. But the whole point is, yes, they do. I mean, when you get yeah. a group of them, they will break social norms, you know. Yeah. And that's uh, uh, one of those things where you just go, yeah, like people get hungry after a disaster or there's a breakdown in society. Yes, people will break those rules, you know. Yeah. Um, that's why Certainly. that's why societal norms exist you know there, there yeah. should be a, a pressure of shame against these kind of things but when it's when it break when there's suddenly no shame attached to it anymore it just clicks and then everyone does it. Just do it yeah yeah, yeah. or, the, or so, they get out of the way of people who do do it you know um one thing i wanted to mention is that um i read this book last in when was it 2012 i think yeah and you were saying, yeah, you read it several times and you remembered uh, who was the murder and stuff. Yeah. Because I did read three stories within this one book, I noticed that these three stories kind of m- mashed up together in my brain. Oh, right. So I was always thinking, oh, there was this woman and he didn't doesn't he go to meet the woman? Wasn't that woman the wife of the of the per- person that was got murdered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the... That's Mixing up one, all yeah. of those stories, yeah. So that, that's the Rebels of Dawn, is it? No, there's the um, oh, what's, let's have a look. Caves of Steel. I'm sure it'll just have it here. Um, Caves of Steel. Ah, oh. well, let's have a look at robots on the robot series over on Goodreads. Uh, yeah, there's what's the next one? Um, Caves of Steel, Naked Sun, and then Robots of Dawn. Yeah, Naked Sun. It was probably though the, these three books I read in one go. Yeah, and they got I, mixed it, up. So kind of when you were up. reading this one, did you remember who I, was the? No, you, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know. So <laughs> every time he was like coming up, I know who's who did it. I know the person. Okay. I always thought, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then it was always like, nah, that wasn't no, it. No, no, that was not right. Yeah. So <laughs> um, coming to the story is is a lie. There's a um, a a murder happens just happens uh we don't see it happening it's just kind of reported like someone comes in and says hey like the um the the what is it the commissioner the commissioner commissioner says elijah bailey you are a uh, an old friend of mine a detective um so help me yeah yeah uh, help me save help me uh find out who killed this person um this spacer someone has killed a spacer this this robot building expert person over here and uh, and here uh, the spacers have sent someone over, uh, detected her over to work with you, and it is, his name is R. Daniel, and it's a robot. He's going to be your partner. He's going to be your partner <laughs> on this one. It's a robot who looks very much like a human, can pass for human, and uh, yeah. So the play, the the the, the story is then um, Elijah Bailey, the detective, having to work with a robot who he doesn't really want to work with. He has to face his own prejudices about working with a robot because robots are not liked, especially because they're taking jobs of other people. That's our Sammy is another robot in the, uh, who was replaced. Was it Vincent? I think the character's name is. Um, yeah. Who was a, a young guy. Vincent who Barrett, was, a young man whose job was yeah. taken over by our Sammy. Yeah. So robots coming and taking people's jobs is a big thing in this world. And, um, yeah, so Elijah Bailey has to work with our Daniel to, like, go, oh, okay, well, who has the motive to kill it? And how did they get a gun? And nobody had a gun. So what, who was, you know, who shot the person? Whatever, whatever. You know, so it's, um, I mean, again, I don't want to get into any spoilers, but what happens, what, what I really like about this is you, you get, like, to that 50% of the book. And he's like, right, I know who's, who's done it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he starts laying it out. And he's like, oh, oh. And it turns out he's wrong. And that... Um, and he takes quite a few stabs at this problem before he finally solves it. Yeah. And that's, that's what I always like about this book, that he, Asimov goes, well, the obvious thing would be this. And normally you, you don't want to just do the obvious thing. And normally detectives in these stories would, would go, well, that's the obvious thing. It can't be that. Or the reason why it's not this, they don't. Yeah. But he, he does this early, get everyone in the room, you know, all of the suspects in a room and talk them through and, and make the accusations yeah. like that. It's kind of like... Miss Marple, yeah. Miss Marple kind of it is the, thing. It is the perfect 
murder <laughs> on the Orient Express uh, yeah. kind of setup, or you know, the butler did it. But you've, to do this, you've got to do the reveal. And I love these scenes in movies where yeah. it's sort of like, why did you call us all here? It can't just be to eat dinner. It's like, no, it isn't to eat dinner. And then the detective <laughs> over dinner goes around each person. It's like, could it have been you? Could it have been you? Could it? Anyway, there's, yeah. a, there's that moment that happens, but it's fifty percent the way through the book. So you're like, well, this can't be it. And it's like, no, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, but I really like it the way that he's like. Every time he does this, he's very certain that yes. he's got all correct. Yes. And and the, the I really like the way that he thinks because he does go from, yeah, this is totally, I get it. Yeah, this could have been the way it was done. Yeah, well, all and the, I was always... Yeah, all the evidence pointed that... Oh, you're breaking up a bit. All the other evidence pointed to his conclusion. It yeah. could have been right, but it didn't account for all of the facts. And that's what I always love about these things. It's like it has to be the, the simplest explanation which accounts yeah. for all of the data. And yeah. it doesn't matter if there's nothing disproves it. It's that uh, falsifiability kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So you have to, you have to um, f- explain away the data and then also try and disprove your own case. Um, yes. Uh, that's wh- that's why a, co- a, a law court can't just say, well, what's all the evidence against this person? And if there's enough evidence, you go, great, ticked. Like, there's like, but okay, but what evidence does is not explained by this and what evidence is against it? You can't yeah. just have the evidence for column. You have to have the evidence against and evidence unexplained uh, yes. columns. And, uh, and there's this thing, it's called uh, evidence motive opportunity. Yes. All these four plus the negative of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need to uh need to be there and um this is why i like this uh also especially because it does have all those riddles and the yeah middling and but, but that's you know. the funny thing is because i knew what the outcome was and i also remember reading this before and having that feeling of like hey this reveal is coming a bit early you know so i remember that yeah. kind of experience of reading it through so i was i was picking out all the clues as i saw them coming up and it's like wow this is it's all right here at the start <laughs> yeah. you know and there's a very important line again talking around spoilers here but there's a very important line halfway through and it just goes by in passing and i was like well that's the key to the entire story <laughs> yes <laughs> like he says no you the one of the the character just said actually no stop don't conflate those two questions you're actually asking two questions there and Elijah Vale is just like yeah blah 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 moves on with it and I was like yeah that is the thing so you're like, yeah. it's so obvious of course it isn't so obvious but it's a good one it is not but I like it the way that he states the three laws of robotics yeah. and then kind of explains how those things are still possible yeah even though you think like these three laws kind of make it so it's impossible for anything to happen with yeah. robot, right? And um, so I always like it that he states these three laws, which seem to be very filling all the holes that yeah. could make a robot do something bad towards a human. Mm. Um, but then in because in the story, he then finds those holes yes. that still makes it possible, yeah, well, which I find so clever. Yeah, that's what I was saying before, that like, all of these stories, every single one of these stories yeah. is about one of the problems. with. The, and so I always find it funny when people say, well, of course, the th- when someone says, oh, we should program robots with the three laws of robotics. And someone says, oh, no, it, it's not really realistic. They wouldn't really work. And people go, no, no, they would work. And I'm like, no, no, literally the entire. This is what those books are for. <laughs> the, the, these are not the books are for. These are all thought experiments about why you you may think you can put in place simple laws like to do this and it, of course it reflects on human human nature and human laws as well it's like yes of course you think you can just put in place a set of three simple rules you know like the golden rule uh, like don't do to other people like or do to other people how you would like them to do to you or don't do to other people do, like yeah. you don't want them to do them to you like and you just go well that's yeah. it that's the only law that we need and it's like turns yeah. out that's not the only law that we no. need yeah. because you're like um do to other people if they like you would like them to do to you and it's sort of like well you know i don't want to i don't want to go to hell when i'm uh, you know when i die i don't want to go to hell so what i should do is make sure nobody else does anything that i think would send them to hell yeah. so yeah. i better kill this abortion doctor then because he's you know causing yeah. other women to sin you're like okay that's a good idea okay kill the abortion you know it's, there's just so many different things yeah. and it's the whole point is that you can't just have three simple rules and in this case one of the things that is brought up it's sort of like well if our sammy um 
uh, encounters or oh, like if, let me put this right if a robot encounters another robot and can't tell if that robot is human or not d- like will the laws of robotics apply that like would they stop would one robot exactly. stop another would robot that, coming from would heart? that robot yeah. think it is a human yeah. because robot is meant to look like a human so and, in that uh, case it's like well okay so the three laws of robotics are don't harm a human uh, or through inaction, let a hu- harm come to a human. Um, obey a human, and then um, protect yourself. And of course, unless yeah. these ones uh, counter the previous law. So yeah, you can destroy yourself to uh, you know whatever like that. But then you're like, okay, but what are the laws about robot robot interaction? Sort of like, is it okay? Don't. I mean, this is just me off the top of my head now. It's sort of like, okay, can a robot accidentally cause another robot? to like can a robot interrupt another robot if that is the order of the person so if you say hey robot interrupt this other robot you know Mm. and what if the thing that the other person the other robot was doing was something to stop harm coming somewhere you know it's like literally one order of interactions later and you're like oh well it's already broken and that's what all of these stories around it's sort of like oh yeah it works on the face of it but as soon as it comes up against real life as soon as it comes up against one human Yes. motivation or intuition or anything at all it all just falls down also i think it is interesting because um the the laws of robotics try to put something in law that within human society is kind of like it is of course a law as well you are not allowed to murder a person this is a law but also humans have this inbuilt you know inhib- inhibition is that the word mm. so that they naturally don't want to kill another person in like generally speaking but then you do have certain circumstances and certain things that make humans kill other humans yes and this is kind of kind of these laws are trying to put in place something that yeah. humans have built in naturally anyway yeah but are still broken yeah, as well it's the whole trolley problem so, it even says in this book yeah. sort of like you can't hear i'm a human it's like no of course i can't and then like this throwaway line is like unless of course there's like two more like there are two or more people over here which i can exactly. save and then yeah maybe i will harm someone and you're just like yeah. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and it's just like skipped over and like but no, you no. don't know until you're not in that situation mm. uh how you would behave yes so in this in this context, I just saw this video on Facebook, yeah. um, which showed a demonstration of I, I don't even I didn't look into it I didn't want to yeah. look further, into it, but it showed a demonstration of a little uh, weapons drone, really small, fit in the palm, palm of a hand, and it has that that person stated it has a, a, an inbuilt AI in it, mm-hmm. so it's not piloted by a human um and then he he started the saying by isn't it good that we now can differentiate be- the, between the good guys and the bad guys oh, and, already this, <laughs> and already this is like why who is saying who are the bad guys and who are the good guys it's always in the you know it's never just black and white no. and if you then have this drone um it's just like okay yeah sure that drone doesn't behave like a human it doesn't disobey orders but a human does mm. and a human does and that can save lives and uh, and a drone just doesn't give a shit <laughs> yeah it's like who is in the loop but i read this amazing article recently by ted chiang you know we were, you just mentioned him on the um reading envy best of the year because you read the short story collection yeah. the stories yes. of your life or it wasn't that collection but you know like a collection there yeah, and so yeah, he's yeah. just read written this article uh, which is sort of like a you know a, a state of the world kind of like what are we looking at at the moment and it's yeah. an, an incredible article because he says these tech people are saying oh we should really look out for artificial intelligence in the future because you know it's this system which doesn't have human controls on it or you know that whatever's going on and we yeah. can't let them take over because they're not in control they don't have any um they don't have compassion yeah well it's not compassion but it you know empathy. it's sort of the, the reflection or i can't remember the, the the word that you used but it's sort of like when you um you you think and then you think about thinking or you do something and you think yeah. about why you know that reflection kind of idea um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and he says, well, we already have that in society, and it's corporations. Corporations exist, and they they yeah. think, but they don't think about thinking. There is no reflecting yes. on their motivations. And yeah. and I thought that was really interesting. Sort of like 
oh, all of the problems that we think are going to happen with robots in the future or could happen with AI in the future are already here. They are already happening and they are corporations and they are other systems of of that are in place which aren't reflective which are and it's a really interesting way of looking i can't remember how i got onto that but it's just one of those things about like oh ai is you know it's okay we know who the good guys are we know who the bad guys are now ai can sort that out and you're like really really can it but you understand that the people saying this or the 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 things that are are causing these things to exist are already exhibiting the problems that AI would have, like corporations yes. being an entity. So like, oh, yeah, corporations can have free speech because they are, you know, they are treated in law in America as people, you know. And it's like, yeah, yeah. but they're people. And if they break the law, they don't get thrown in jail because it's a corporation no. or it, it's a corporation. But if they're that greedy, nobody says, oh, you stop being so greedy because greed is just yeah. built into them. And so there could, like, if you think about it, there could be this thing sort of like the three laws of robotics could be applied to the corporations. But of course it doesn't because there's only one law to these corporations, which is, you know, provide value to shareholders or something. And everything yeah. else gets subsumed into that. So like, well, I guess exactly. we should follow some laws maybe. It's like, yeah, yeah but if it's, if so it's in if our best interest in... If you look at it that way, it's like the most egoistic thinking entity, you know, they are thinking about their own good. Hello? You still yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they are only thinking about how they are sustaining, how they growing. Yeah. And they don't, as I said before, they don't have compassion. They don't have empathy because it is only about their own goal. Yeah, right? but my point is, it, or the point of the article is, is that even if individuals within a corporation do have empathy yeah. and compassion, have and have good goals as well, you know, like Elon yeah. Musk, it's one of those things that Elon Musk, like, oh yeah, we've got to save the world, so we've got to have batteries and electric cars, and we've got to get to space. So it doesn't matter about the noble goals, the 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 mindset, the corporation and capitalistic mindset of the people exhibits all of the problems that Elon Musk himself says we've got to look out for these in the ai it's sort of like well look at yourself oh, yeah, and it's yeah. that lack of reflection that's the the thing yeah uh, yeah yeah all right and it is quite interesting because we recently just you know uh we're talking more about robots and have it in our household and stuff yeah uh, so uh, i did listen to or not podcast and you know that wait that a second you're waking up, you're play, waking up quite free- a bit Stop a second. You're breaking up a bit. Oh, sorry. Go back. Okay. So there's a podcast called Robot or Not um, yes. on the Incomparable Network. So, uh, yeah, talk about that then. Let's go. Yeah, yeah you you want you made me listen to it a few times. Like, I, I listened to episodes. a few of them. Yeah, the um, episode's like two minutes long, and it gets good. Episode two is where you should start. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so it is, was to more, think more about what is actually a robot. Is a dishwasher a robot or not? Yeah. And, uh, this kind of stuff. So it is interesting to, for me to listen to, but I have such a problem to get past the, uh, incoming jingle or how, whatever they play at the beginning. <laughs> it kills me. <laughs> the robot it's or not, not jingle. Awful. Yeah. Because it, yeah. But it's, it, it, it's the whole point is that it sounds like a robot singing, like a robot doesn't understand music. It sounds like, what if a robot writes a jingle? It doesn't understand melody. That's the whole point of that. That's what I really like about it. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. Uh, the later it. episodes, other people have versions of it, and they have like, there's sort of like 12 different robot or not themes. Of course, they're all like five seconds long, so it gets through. Yeah. As long as they are not like two voices kind of. Just no. singing next to each other, but just not getting it. Just yeah. like next to the ah, oh, it hurts my my ears so much. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's quite a funny thing to to listen to. Yeah, uh, to figure out uh, is it a robot or not? Yes, um, because we do have our little Art Daniel at home, right? Yes, we have a little um, what, what's it called? E bots, whatever. Anyway, it's a. Uh, the idea it's being a vacuum Hoover thing, yeah, a vacuum cleaner, little Roomba kind of thing, and yes, we, we there's an app where you can you control it and uh, and and do it, and you can name the app. No, you can name the robot. You in can the name app. the robot. Yeah. Yes. So uh, so once you give it a name, does it make a difference? Once you know that R. Daniel, like once you know that this guy who is a robot that looks like a human does yeah. have a name. Yeah. Does it make it different? Does it make it? I don't know. You know, but do we do we treat our little robot at home? We actually called the little robot our Daniel. Um, 
after the robot in these robot books. But uh, yeah, do you think of our little floor sweeping robot differently now that it's got a name? Well, I wouldn't say I, I'm thinking about it as a, uh, a human, obviously not. But it, it does have more of a, a, not a character, but it does more have like a, a personal feel because yeah. it is an is individual and entity and it does go around uh, and, and of course I give it the order to do something but it does it by itself you know I mean it does go around and clean the floor you know so it's um, uh, for me it feels a lot different than a kettle or a dishwasher or washing machine because it does move around you know yeah Self, self-directed movement um, to accomplish a task yes that is one of those things I'm not sure. Yeah. Like again, there is a robot. There's a whole podcast called Robot or Not, which uh, uh, it's good. There's a hundred episodes listing. Like, is this a robot? Yes or no? Is this a robot? Yes or no? And I agree <laughs> with about ninety percent of uh, yeah. John Syracuse's declarations. <laughs> but there are a few things where I'm like, nah, not not quite there. Although his <laughs> his logic is good, but some of his uh, first principles I I don't uh, get. Like sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, entirely convinced with. Right? Shall we look through some of the notes? I made some notes here in the, in the book. Okay. Well, my early notes um, were the notes about the the laws of robotics. Oh, okay. I, I put them out again to have them there. Um, that's basically all the notes um, that I have. Yeah. Except general feelings towards the book. Well, we'll talk about <laughs> them in a bit. Okay. So there's this. What I what was this thing that I made a note of here? Um, uh, it says you, he calls you the friendliest. He calls you the friendliest name he knows. You know, our Sammy. This is our Sammy, the the idiot um, uh, police robot, task, the task, robot little yeah. task robot. And it says it says a friendship circuit. No robot built of any type could possibly hurt a human he- being. So the I, the the um, w- the notes that I made, which is like this idea of being a, um, a friendship circuit, but then. Yeah. Um, other people are saying, oh, this, but they also talk about the human's loyalty quota. And I think it's funny that they kind of, there's an idea that robots have friendship programs built in, but humans have been kind of bred over the thousand years or a few, few thousand years between now in our time and the time this book is set to have kind of yeah. like a high loyalty quota. And the people yeah. with a high loyalty quota are the ones who get the jobs in the police force and other things like that. So yeah. I, I, can't, I always like the idea of like, okay, well, um, how do we reduce suffering in this way? Let's, this, the example I always like is with, um, with animal cruelty. You know, yeah. one thing that we could do is treat chickens better. The other thing we could do is breed them so they don't, ha- they have smaller and smaller brains so they can't feel, they don't recognize suffering or can't feel pain anymore. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. oh, there's two different ways to get to this thing. Like we could, oh, we can yeah. create, create artificial meat as well. Let's do that. We can create a, a, a sack of cells which just sits there and doesn't do anything except it just, you know, just builds up Take muscle like mass and then you just <laughs> kill it. And it's like, like, it's like, yeah, that's kind of what we've done now with battery farming. We've like bred these chickens so they can't even stand up anymore. All they do is eat and shit. And then like after 20 days, they're big enough to kill and eat or whatever it is, you know, like that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And b- because the brain is a chicken, it can't feel. It's not like a cow, which has emotions and stuff. Yeah. It just kills. So it's one of those things that like, oh, right. You can program things in, create things for, for real, or maybe thousands of years of social evolution and conditioning makes it that you can then just select out of the 20 million people in the city just select the ones with the highest loyalty quota and their lowest you know there's these different quotas of humans so I, I thought that was an interesting idea um yeah i uh, also like the you know that the robot yeah um he has this thing um cerebral um, analytics that you know where he scans this the oh, brain yeah, yeah. What was this called? Cerebral, cerebral something. Yeah, it's like scanning. Yeah. It's like a MRI scan. Um, not MRI. What is it? The um... yeah, my MRI. No, yeah, no, no, you no, know, no. It's not MRI. It's the one where you 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 the, the brain function uh, one. Yeah, it's an fMRI where oh, you yeah. can see yeah, functional. What is the, yeah, yeah what it. is the one? What are the parts that are active now? Yes, it's an and fMRI. Then, and you can yeah. see into, yes. Um, so I thought that I was quite funny because. Um, Obviously, some of the humans didn't know it was done to them. <laughs> well, that's that's the key point in the book. That that at the start he's like, oh yeah, and I and I give him a lie detector test, but it's like a lie detector test that he doesn't know has happened, which is uh, a funny yeah, bit. yeah, scanning his brain. Yeah. Um, 
it gets some of the stuff with between Lige Bailey and his wife gets a bit dark. Uh, and again, it's one of those things like, oh, this was written in the 1950s. How much of this is just sexism yeah. at the time? How much of it is this character himself like being portrayed as not a good person? And I think that's part of it as well. So it's this mix of like, oh, how much of this sexism yeah. is Isaac Asimov's at the time? And how much of it is him commenting on like the kind of person who would do that? Character. Yeah. 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 And, and for me, the way I look at it, it's like, it's a bit fi- about 50-50. There are a few <laughs> things which seem yeah. to be written into all women and all men and some things which are specific of some characters, um, yes. which, is, uh, which is strange. Uh, some of the writing, I think, is like, it gets very clunky at some points. For example, there's this, um, uh, uh, the, the, for example, his wife is saying, uh, J- uh, Jezebel or Jesse is saying, um, She's actually within a conversation, within sort of her dialogue. I, I used to ask her how she was so sure uh, that was so, especially after you and I met Lige. Remember the t- talks we used to have. And then she would quote, but the, the remember the talks we used to have is in brackets. And I always find it weird when you read dialogue and someone is saying something and then they say something in parentheses. And, yes. and I'm like, but parentheses are written. Are they spoken? Wouldn't it be like, you know, couldn't it be like, and she said, whimsically or you know i don't know it's one of those things that you know that could just be written into the sentences with normal punctuations parentheses within within spoken dialogue i think is one of those things which i'm like that seemed to be i don't know how how do they have that in there like is is she saying that or is she thinking that i'm not really sure but then i'm never sure sometimes uh publishers do change this kind of stuff right yeah yeah that would be Edited, yeah, maybe. it's a little bit always like in uh, sheet music, you always have to differentiate between what the composer actually wrote and what yeah. the publisher added for ease of reading, you know. Yeah. Um, and this could be certainly something that the publishers just uh, adapted to their yeah. style or whatever. So um, that yeah. could be possible. I mean, that's a, very, that's a minor point, very specific, but there are some other things. I do have some other complaints about some of the writing, which is sort of like, suddenly, this person is an expert on the Bible. It's like, yeah, you know, Isaac Asimov yeah. wrote like 20 books about the Bible and then 40 history books or whatever it is. Oh, like, convenient. Yeah, it's like very convenient that this one person just <laughs> happens to know the story. And, and even, I mean, this is set thousands of years in the future, but even from 1954 <laughs> to today, what's that, like 60 yeah. years later or whatever, um, 60 years later if you said the word Jezebel to somebody, most people, I, I reckon that these days, most people wouldn't pick up on that as being yeah. a, a, a biblical reference. Bible reference, yeah. I mean, there is, I the, the same. There is still um, the connotation that Jezebel is a witch or Jezebel is the evil woman, that, you know, like so yeah. that still survives, but that people would be able to just go, oh yeah, but you know that story in the Bible and then just talk about the story in the Bible. And at one point he's like, oh, now let me just quote part of the Bible. And it is a famous passage, you know, sort of like it's a famous parable. Mm-hmm. So it's okay to be, people would be able to retell that parable. But even now, like who... Like, who knows the parables of Jesus in that way that they could just start quoting them or like, oh, Jehoshaphat. And I'm like, who? (laughs) Yeah, this is like, this is what they used to swear, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think only Elijah Bailey does that. But yeah, it is one of those weird things that you go, oh, they, they, there's a bit of Shakespeare quoting. But then at some (laughs) points, like, you just go, if everybody, if this is that important for everyone, but then the the robot is sort of like, you know about Jesus? And he's like, who? You know the Bible? What? And I'm like, (laughs) yeah. You were sent yeah, it's into like the, the world. The robot, yeah. yeah, the robot is kind of like the modern human. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, that is true in a way. But yeah, there's, everyone's got biblical names. All these people have got bits like Elijah Bailey and Daniel. Yeah. Like Daniel, is sort of, well, kind of Daniel and Jezebel. Samuel. I mean, our Sammy. Yes, yeah, no? Samuel. Sammy? Yeah, it's, it's all very big. And of course, the, the the son, what's his, Bentley or Ben or something like Bentley, that? Bentley, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Bentley Bailey, and they're like, "That's a funny Is name." Is also it's, a big name, ben yeah. Bentley? No, it's specifically not. It's specifically uh, not. That's what they said. We, uh, we. This is not a. Uh, uh, a biblical name she says i don't want a biblical name yeah. any name which is yeah. which is but yeah Non-num- sort of like so yeah. the commissioner is called julius that's a bit of like caesar pay unto caesar you know it's all of these different yeah. things were in there um not all of them are, not all of the names are biblical names but it, it just uh, it does it does feel a bit weird that like oh so in a thousand years time people are still going to be quoting the bible and knowing the bible and knowing the character from the bible and it's going to be like a defining part of the personality that they have this name from the bible 
And yeah. already that doesn't matter. My name, I was, I was, I have biblical, like all my family have biblical names. There's Nathan and Leah and Bethany and Luke, you know, all biblical names. But Luke isn't a biblical name anymore. Luke is now a Star Wars name. You know, yes. when I was growing up, nobody was like, oh, I mean, there was a few times if I was hanging out with someone called Mark and Matthew and, and I'm Luke yeah. and we're like, oh, we just that's need a John. Yeah. Once we get a John, we'll compute, com, com, you know, complete yeah. the set. But that's like saying yeah. John and Paul and uh, what comes after John and Paul now? That's the thing. No idea. Oh, so it's not going to be... What? No, nothing. Ringo or something. <laughs> the point is that, like, different names, John and Paul is more Beatles now than, uh, yeah, than it is Apostles or something like that. It's the Apostle Paul. Sure. It's John the, you know, John the Baptist or whatever. But then that's not like, eh, no, it's... Uh, <laughs> they're the, they're yeah. the Beatles, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the Apostles have changed to, to... It's kind of like you have modern um, collection of names of people... Yeah. who are more important than something. Yeah. Well, that's what, of that's what I'm saying. Even the Beatles, the Beatles said, oh, we're bigger than Jesus or, or whatever the quote was, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure like in, in a, if you write a book uh, thousands, thousands of years um, from now, you need to invent some new kind of pop culture kind of thing well, that's that, a, that they then reference. So, yeah. you know. Well, that's the thing that really annoyed me about this book that I read recent. Well, last year I think it was now, so probably a year and a half ago, which was called um, "We Are Legion, uh, We Are Bob." Bob. And yeah. again, a biblical reference right there in the in the uh, in the title. And all right. and it's a book. It's like a Ready Player One kind of book where the main character yeah. is a nerd who knows all the references and stuff. And mm-hmm. he goes hundreds of years into the future. And then all of his references and all of his I'm fandom is about... Have to have to know. Well, no, it's, the whole point is that he, he, he comes out 100 year, 200 years in the future and is the biggest Star Trek fan and the biggest Star Wars fan and the biggest fan of this and the biggest fan of that. But then yeah. he exhibits literally zero, zero um, uh, curiosity about what has happened in Star Trek after, like... 2014 or yeah. whenever the book was so it feels first like set. it was just it's like everything went up to now and then stops and, and then, yeah but but and i think it's because the author of the book is doesn't want to upset people when he would say yeah. uh, like it, but you could have said this easily with star wars like oh yeah up until 1999 star wars star wars star wars and then the 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 brave author of a book which was written in 1998 would say, oh, and then there was another trilogy of movies came out, and they were so bad that they became some of the worst reviled movies, and it spoiled <laughs> people's stuff like that. Like a good author, like a good author would yeah. write that, and everyone would go, no, no, not not Star Wars. No, it can't be. Yeah. No, it can't be not Star Wars. It's not Star Trek. It's not like every other movie is bad, like Star Trek. No, yeah. these are good movies. But in this book, in this book, it was sort of like, yeah, and then like, and then I woke up, and I was thinking, go back and read all the books and see all the movies and see all the TV shows that you've missed in that time that when you died yeah. in 2014, like mm. Star Trek discoveries come out like loads more Star Wars movie, but no, it, the, the author of the book was so incurious about it that he just wasn't willing to invent new um, invent, popular yeah. culture. And that is always the, the, I mean, this is kind of what makes good authors or amazing authors amazing is that they not only invent a story. They invent the stories for the people read to in the book, yeah. I exactly. mean, that's what Yoon Harley did as well in with in Nine Box yeah. Gambit. She's like, oh yeah, and I go and watch my so- soap operas and stuff. And it's like, yes, it's soap operas, but it wasn't just soap operas. It was like a new form of like story, like that it only exists in their future. That kind of mm. TV show or whatever it is. So uh, with the characters, anyway, uh, I think that's it of this yeah. of this book let's give some ratings here because i do need to go and catch a, a get a taxi in a in 15 and minutes i need to get a taxi to the airport okay do it um well my rating doesn't change since i last re- read it yeah so be five stars for me five stars yeah oh okay sure okay that's i I didn't realize this was a five star kind of book for you not for me i don't think but it is still highly rated i would still call this a four star book because even though i read it a few times before and this reading like i it is one of those books which is short enough that i can reread it and not have to worry too much about knowing what happens or like you know i can get some out yeah maybe not a five maybe four and a half but but for good reasons it's five five star (laughs) 
you go with five stars if you want. I'm going to go with four stars. So let's call it a four a four point five star. But also, it is one of those books which is so. I do think it's a science fiction classic, and it is one of uh, oh, yeah, Isaac Asimov's best books. And I think it's one of his best books for a reason, or one of his most famous books for a reason, because mm-hmm. it is a really great, a really good fun. If flawed um detective novel plus a yeah. really interesting um experimental uh, like yeah kind through. of like society <laughs> like dystopian kind of thing and a really good exploration of the robot kind of stuff yes. you know so if you want yeah. like a good introduction to the robot stories by isaac asimov this isn't a bad place to start because there is a lot of humanity in there as well and it does follow along uh, of course the short stories are good but you know if you're not int- that interested yeah. in, in a quirky short story this is a good place to start so uh yeah i think so too and this links I up with this the, other series as well place. it kind of when i was reading this i was like oh yeah maybe it isn't completely weird that he linked up this series to his foundation series it kind of this one kind of lays the groundwork of like linking those series together but have you ever read foundation yeah. i'm not sure no i didn't no i haven't okay. yet well maybe we'll get maybe to that at some point um like mm-hmm. like this book this was written as a serial in a in a uh what was it it was it was as a serial published in uh, uh, galaxy magazine december 53 uh and then in uh yeah and then 1954 it was made combined into a, a hardcover book that's quite a lot of these old stories are well, these fix up things but yeah. this is a very good story all links together it's like yes this was definitely written as a single story unlike the foundation books where it's sort of like yes we've got four short novellas here or four short story or five short stories or something we combine them together we'll call that a novel it's it's much more of a single story than a lot of his Did other she- do you think this should be made into a movie? Uh, this book? Uh, yeah. uh, I, well, the the problem is Will Smith came along and made iRobot and kind of soured me on the, <laughs> I, the uh, Asimov Isaac Asimov movies because they can't sure. help but break the laws of robot. It's not an exploration of how the laws of robotics are broken. It always yeah. becomes, let's just break the laws of robotics. And it's like, that's not the point. That's, that's not it, the it, point. To be honest, yeah. it wouldn't be that bad of a movie if it was just sort of yeah. like, oh, this is just a movie and we're just going to like reference the, the laws of robotics. But because it's called iRobot, it's sort of like every movie that comes out now will be mostly compared to that Will Smith movie rather than sure. and that's another one which they, they messes up in that book and so in the start of that movie he puts on like a cd player and then he's like i'm gonna put on my trainers it's like yeah vintage 2002 trainers and i sort of like <laughs> look at my watch and i was like what's the date today oh yeah it's 2002 <laughs> that cd player you can buy in the shops now those trainers you can buy right now and it's like oh that's so awful like the product placement made it so someone who was interested yeah. in the past was interested in our exact past right now exactly oh, as this boy. exactly as this yeah, yeah. Uh, is this book yeah. as well. but i do like it actually it, one more thing about this book that i like is when they're talking about the current day they call it the middle ages so like we are medieval yeah, we, it's today. all medieval stuff well it, it says Medi- oh back in the mid- medieval times and it's like yeah we yeah. are kind of medieval but of course the, i think the the joke is on them because we look at their society they're kind of almost post apocalyptic well, it's not post apocalyptic yeah. but you know like uh um, Malthusian uh, caution case of eight billion people all living inside and being afraid to go outside, and we're the and medieval ones. Stuff. Yeah. And say again. They're smelly. Yeah, yeah. It, oh, yeah. It's all like, oh, turns out, turns out, put twenty million people with no Under air, top. with no <laughs> air movement. Oh, it gets a bit stinky. Yeah, as mentioned yeah. a few times, is the smell of the city. All right, that's it. Yeah. We're doing fifty minutes on that, and I was yes. hoping to do about thirty minutes, but we always sorry. We, no, it was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, go on here as well. Um, it says more recently, uh, Akiva Goldsman has been hired to produce a movie. Um, so yeah, uh, okay, maybe. Uh, and he so. and he he was a screenwriter. Uh, Batman Forever, oof, Batman and Robin, mm. but I Am Legend and Cinderella Man. M- m- so he's he has worked on nineteen fifties uh, with I Am Legend. It's kind of a bit of. Uh, um, that's that's sort of like a 1950s book in this style where you go oh it's a classic of science fiction slash fantasy slash horror whatever and yeah uh, and that well, was we'll see. not not too good and uh yes he's a uh, uh also a beautiful mind he got the academy award for that yeah. so who good. knows maybe, well, maybe. akiva j one. goldsman will uh, do a good job with uh with this who knows Sure. Oh, all right. He, oh, no, no, my problem. My Wanted problem. To wrap up. 2004, he wrote 
iRobot. Boo. Okay. Boo. So that's what I'm saying. If it's made into a movie, I didn't want anyone who wrote iRobot to have anything to do with it. And unfortunately, <laughs> Wikipedia tells me that the person has been hired like to that. produce the movie is the person who also did iRobot. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Luke Purge. Juliana is on Twitter. She is J-U-K-U Berlin. Yuku Berlin. It kind of stands for a name. And... Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm Luke Boge there. And on YouTube, I'm Luke Boge there. And in the new year, uh, we'll talk more about YouTube. And uh, what else do I say? Oh, yeah. Check out sfbrp.com and you can yeah. uh, see every episode that we've done. Um, all the books listed in order. There's the archive feed there if you want to go back and listen to starting on episode number one. Um, it is the 21st of December. This will be our last, uh, probably our last joint podcast before the new year. Um, yeah, that's right. So, uh, Happy New Year, Juliana. Another, another month. Happy, yeah. happy New Year, Happy Christmas. Yes, everything like that. Although I do have some other podcasts to record, which will probably be going up in a few days. But I'm going to Antarctica twice. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's going to be my uh, next, next time. Uh, yes, and also go over to Goodreads and we can see what you think about this book. For example, this book, Friends Reviews, is a 3.97 rating. Michael rated it five stars. Julie Davis, five stars. Stephen rated it four stars. Hollow Man, four stars. Yes, so this is, seems to be a quite highly rated. Um, Paul rated it three stars. Dated, but worth a read if you like classic science fiction. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. Stuff. Juliana Cunningham right. rated it five stars. Right, that's it. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot for listening, and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.